All right, in this video, we're going to just do a, a quick little recap of some basic integration techniques that we've already seen in other calculus courses, most likely. So I want to do a quick review of U substitution. Then I want to just show off a whole bag of little algebra tricks that we can apply to certain situations to make anti-differentiation and integration a little bit easier. Uh, then I'll focus on completing the square and polynomial long division just to remind ourselves for how those things go. Again, these integration techniques that we're going to show off in this video are all going to be review or recap of things that you likely have seen before. If not, this is going to give us a good time to just kind of fill in any gaps that we may have missed or shake off some of the rust. The goal here is that as we move into newer, bigger, more complicated integration techniques, we'll be able to make sure we can balance those with these kind of basic ones that we already have along with us. So let's start with a quick recap of U substitution. You might remember how U substitution works. The main goal is that we're undoing the chain rule rule for differentiation. Um, because of that, we're going to be looking for some specific structures. So let's just remind ourselves about what the chain rule says. The chain rule says that if you have a composite function, some function composed inside of another one, and you want to differentiate it with regard to this input variable x, then what we can do is say, all right, this interior part we'll call u. So what we're really looking for is the derivative of f of this new variable u. And because u and x are not the same thing, then what we have to do is look at the derivative of, oops, sorry, the derivative of f of u with regard to u, and then multiply that by the derivative with regard to x of whatever u is. So we end up with df over du times du over dx. In practice, what this looks like is f prime of our inside function, what we called u, g of x, times the derivative of that inside function, g prime. So here we can see the structure that we're going to be looking for. Remember, we're going to be doing this backward stuff. We're going to be looking for a, comp or a function composed inside of another one, and we're also looking for this function derivative pair. Now we have a whole bunch of structure that we're going to have where we say, okay, we'll label the inside function, the co composed function on the inside uh, as u, and then we'll define our differential du, and then we'll be able to kind of do some fancy structural integration stuff to make it look a lot easier for each problem. Here are some examples that we can take a look at, and sometimes it can be tricky to identify what u is. In this case, if we have a hard time seeing it, I always recommend to rewrite things with exponents. And now we can say, oh, okay, look, there's all this stuff on the inside of this set of parentheses raised to an exponent. So what we'll do is we'll let u equal, maybe I'll write this over in this margin. We'll let u equal 4 minus 2x du is always equal to u prime dx, the derivative of u with regard to x times the differential dx. You could get this from du over dx and multiply both sides by dx, whatever. And so du in this case is negative 2 dx. And you might be saying, well, wait a second, we don't have that function and derivative pair, but we kind of do. We're just off by a coefficient, right? So there's lots of different ways that people do this. What I normally do is I just multiply the coefficient and then undo that multiplication with division. So I put the coefficient wherever I need it to be by multiplying it on the inside of my integral, and then I multiply the reciprocal on the outside of the integral. Some people will do some solving for dx or something like that, and that's all fine too. Now what we have is this negative a half times this part in the numerator becomes du, and the part in the denominator we defined as u. So we have negative half integral 1 over u du. This is an easy integral. We know that the antiderivative of 1 over u, or at least one of the antiderivatives of 1 over u, is going to be this natural log function. So we have half times the natural log whoops, of the absolute value of u. And then we have that constant of integration, plus c. Now, all we need to do is put things back in terms of x. So let's take whatever we defined u to be, chuck it back in here, and we've got negative half. There we go. Natural log of the absolute value of 4 minus 2x plus c. Cool. And you can check this by just doing some differentiation. You should notice that you're going to have to do the chain rule on here, which is good because, remember, 
we're trying to undo the chain rule when we do this anti-differentiation stuff. So that's how that one goes. Uh, in this second one, it might be a little bit easier to figure out what u is, right? It's going to be this inside part here in a set of parentheses raised to an exponent. So we've got u is equal to 5 plus x squared. du then is 2x dx because that's the derivative of what u is. And you'll notice, oh, no, we're missing that 2 coefficient. No big deal. I'll put it in place. Multiply by a half out front to undo that. And now I've got half times all of this stuff here gets wrapped up together and becomes du. So I'll throw that at the end of my integral because I like my differentials at the end. That's where they're supposed to go. And then all this stuff on the inside of the parentheses are really just u. So instead of 5 plus x squared to the 7, we have u to the 7. And again, this makes this integration problem super easy. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by that number. So we've got half times u to the 8 over 8 plus c. And we can substitute 5 plus x squared back in place. I'll multiply those denominators. And I've got 5 plus x squared to the 8 over 16 plus c. Hopefully that gives you a nice little reminder about how u substitution can work. There are harder problems that we can look at where they're not just set up so nicely. Uh, these kinds of problems are some of my favorites. I call these turnaround problems, uh, mostly because that's what my calculus teacher called them when I was first learning calculus. Here, we're going to pick the inside part of the square root as u. And we'll say, all right, that's x plus 2. And that means that du, if this is u, du is just the derivative of x plus 2 times dx. So that's 1 times dx. So I'll just call it dx. So that means this right here is du. And you'll notice, oh no, this little x is lonely all by itself. If we go ahead and do our substitution, you'll notice we have this x here. And then we have u to the half, our square root of u, du. The problem is that this isn't translated all the way in terms of u's. So what we can do is turn our u substitution around. Let's figure out what x is in terms of u. We can just solve this little u substitution that we've got, this rule that we defined here for x. And if u is equal to x plus 2, then x is equal to u minus 2. Cool. So suddenly we have an integral of u minus 2 times u to the half du. And we can do the distributive property on this. We can just multiply all this stuff out. This becomes u to the 3 halves minus 2u to the half du. And now we're just in our nice little power function. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by that number. So we've got u to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves, or multiplied by 2 fifths, minus 2u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds, or divided by 3 halves. Oops, I don't need this integral sign. I'm tripping. There we go, plus c. And now we can go ahead and substitute everything back. And we can say this is really 2 times x plus 2 to the 5 halves over 5 minus 4 times x plus 2 to the 3 halves over 3 plus c. So these little turnaround problems show up when we have an extra variable x floating around. It doesn't get wrapped up in our substitution right away. We can just go ahead and take care of that. All right, let's look at some other algebra tricks. This is not going to be an exhaustive list, so feel free to go back and review some other Calc 1 resources and things like that. But these are just some that I thought of off the top of my head really quickly to, to show off that would be, I think, helpful. Um, this is one of my favorite little algebra tricks that shows up splitting fractions. Normally, I look for this upside-down triangle shape that we have. And we'll just rewrite this as a sum of two fractions with the same denominator. Now normally, we might go the other way, right? We might start with this sum and say, oh, look, common denominator, let's add them together. So add the numerators, x e to the x plus 1, all over that common denominator x. But you'll notice when we do this, we have, oops, we have a nice little common factor in the numerator and denominator of our first fraction. And so this simplifies to just e to the x plus 1 over x. And now we can just integrate things term by term because we have this really nice property that says the integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. The antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. Then we've got a natural log. 
add on our constant of integration, and we're good to go. So I always hunt for those upside down triangles, many terms in the numerator, not many terms in the denominator. Most of the time it's easiest when there's only one term in the denominator. If there are more, if this was like an x plus one, we'd have to split things up all over x plus ones, and then our nice tricks wouldn't work out as nicely. Oh well. Uh, we can simplify complex fractions. I don't love this term, complex fractions, because I never really know what it's talking about. Complex just means hard, right? And there are tons of different hard fractions, but let me show you what I mean. I don't know if this is what it's called everywhere, but I've seen it called this in pre-algebra type courses, where they refer to complex fractions as essentially fractions inside of fractions. Um, and so in algebra or pre-algebra or things like that, I don't know, you might see something like this. I don't know, something like that. And we can simplify these. There's a whole bunch of different ways. You can deal with the addition in the denominator if you'd like. Or what you can notice is that we can just multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same quantity. All we're really doing here is multiplying this integral by 1 or the integrand by 1. But if we do this, we'll have to use the distributive property. We'll multiply this e to the x on the whole denominator. That's going to give us e to the x squared plus 1. And then in the numerator, we have e to the x. And I'll move my differential dx to the outside now. Now, this is helpful because hopefully we can see that there's some nice u substitution now, right? This is composed on the inside, u. If u is equal to e to the x, then du is e to the x dx, and we can say that's right here. So suddenly, this integral becomes du over u squared plus 1, or if you'd rather, 1 over u squared plus 1 du. And you might remember that this is the derivative form of an inverse tangent. So we can say, all right, our antiderivative looks like tan inverse of u, which in this case is tan inverse of e to the x, and then, of course, our constant of integration plus c. Nice. So we can kind of force a u substitution here in some cases when we multiply out those fractions. This normally is going to show up if you have a negative exponent in the denominator already. See if you can make the nice move of uh, simplifying that a little bit. What some people will do is they'll say, oh, a negative exponent, that moves it up to the numerator. But notice that we have to deal with this addition first. So what I would do is just, again, clear out that fraction by multiplying out a common denominator on the numerator and the denominator of your um, big fraction. Hopefully that's helpful. We can remind ourselves about how conjugates can be helpful. Uh, conjugates are if you have some sort of a uh, square root of a plus a square root of b, then the conjugate would look like a square root of a minus a square root of b. We switch the sign of the second part. Most students first time seeing this um, or first time really working with it like explicitly is when we're dealing with complex numbers because we have this a plus bi and then an a minus bi is the conjugate uh, where i is the imaginary unit. And so that's sometimes helpful. What we're going to do is take a look at conjugates in this context and see why it might be helpful. Notice that the conjugate of the square root of x plus 3 is a square root of x minus 3. I'm going to multiply. And you'll see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the square root of x minus 3 on the top and on the bottom, just like I multiplied e to the x on the top and bottom to simplify that complex fraction that we had, and then I've got my differential dx. If we do this, the numerator is going to be x minus 9 times the square root of x minus 3. I'm not going to multiply that out. That seems terrible. And then you'll notice that what we have here is a difference of squares on the denominator. The square root of x times the square root of x is x, really an absolute value of x, but whatever. Uh, and then we have a 3 root x and a negative 3 root x. Well, that's 0. And then we have a 3 times negative 3. That's minus 9. And look at that. These two things are the same. And so this simplifies down to the square root of x minus 3 dx. I'm going to write that as x to the half 
minus 3 dx, and I'll let you finish that one out, because now suddenly this becomes pretty easy to anti-differentiate. We can do the same thing here. We can multiply by a 1 minus cosine of x, and that means that we're left with an integral of 1 minus cosine x over 1 squared, that's 1, minus cosine squared. And this is helpful because, wait, we've got a nice trig identity here. Oops, I forgot the x. There we go. That says that this thing is really sine squared. And so we can say 1 minus cosine x over sine squared x dx. And suddenly, bang, we have this nice upside down triangle. Everything will work out pretty well here. We can say this is 1 over sine squared. That's cosecant squared minus cosine x over sine squared x. And we should know our antiderivative of this one. This one is a good one. And then for this one, we can do u substitution. So I'll let you finish that out. But split this up into two integrals where we have a cosecant squared dx minus an integral of cosine x over sine squared x. U substitution on the second one, nice little antiderivative form on the first one. You should end up with like a negative cotangent function there. We can also do some completing the square. We'll remind ourselves about how this works. This is an old algebra technique that we probably use to take parabolas from standard form and put them into vertex form so we can see the transformations and exactly find the vertex without having to uh, find the zeros and things like that. It's sometimes relatively helpful in algebra courses. We'll remind ourselves how completing the square works. And then we'll show how it can be helpful, really helpful, in a calculus course. So if we complete the square on this thing, we're looking to turn this standard form parabola into a vertex form parabola. What we're going to notice is that all of this is going to rely on the fact that we know what x minus h squared is. It's x squared minus 2xh plus h squared. Now, if you had an x plus h squared, you'll notice that the sign on h just switches. That's not going to worry about the sign on h squared. It's still positive, but then this part becomes positive. So we have x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So what we want to do is find some perfect square that we can just add a constant to to get this polynomial. Now, if we take a look at this middle term, this middle term has to be in this form of 2 times x times h. So it's super easy to see what h is. Obviously, the only thing that we can multiply by 2 and by x to get 6x is 3. So what we have is x plus 3 squared. Now, the problem is that x plus 3 squared is really x squared plus 6x plus 9. So what I'm going to do is take this polynomial, and I'm just going to write it a little bit differently. So we're going to call it x squared plus 6x plus something minus something, 13. And now what we've seen is that I already know what that something is going to be. I want to make this x squared plus 6x plus 9, and then I'll just subtract off 9. Now notice, when I add and subtract 9, that's really not doing anything. But if I write it this way, I can take this stuff and say this was that perfect square polynomial, my x plus 3 squared. And then I can take the rest of it and figure out what was left over. Well, it was 13 and negative 9, and so this is really plus 4. Or the way that I always think of it is I know that this is going to have to be factored into some sort of an x plus 3 squared, but x plus 3 squared is x squared plus 6x plus 9. I have a plus 13, so I need to add four more units to this to get what we need. So this is the completed square version of x squared plus 6x plus 13. How is that helpful? Well, let's take a look. Here's in our denominator this x squared plus 6x plus 13. So let's go ahead and complete the square on this. And we have dx over x plus 3 squared plus 4. Or, if you'd rather, 
1 over x plus 3 squared plus 4. And you'll notice that this is in the form of an inverse tangent. You might have that inverse tangent formula with like an a value, where here a squared is 4, and so a is 2. And so either way, if you can do some u substitution or whatever, and this ends up being half inverse tangent of x plus 3 over 2 plus c. Oh, I don't know why I wrote this integral sign in there. There we go. So completing the square gets us into this nice inverse tangent form. You'll notice that we can do a similar thing here. Before we do anything, I'm going to factor this negative out, just so we don't have to really worry about it too much. So now this is x squared minus 10x plus 16. And let's do the completing the square on just the set in parentheses. You can pause the video if you'd like and give this a shot just to see if you can complete the square well. Um, but it's not too bad to do. All right, we're back. So we still have our dx. We still have a negative. But now when we complete the square, we're going to have an x minus 5 squared. Because when we multiply out x minus 5 times x minus 5, we're going to get an x squared minus 5x minus 5x. So there's our minus 10. But then we're going to have a plus 25. Now, we only have a plus 16. So you'll notice we have to subtract 9 from our plus 25. I'm going to multiply this negative back in. And so we can see. This is dx over the square root of positive 9 minus x minus 5 squared. And would you look at that? This is in that inverse sine form. So you're going to end up with an inverse sine of x minus 5 over 3 plus c. And that works out pretty well. So completing the square is really nice sometimes if we have some quadratic thing and we're looking for something in the form of a linear piece squared, like in these inverse trig functions. Their derivatives all have these linear pieces squared. We can apply some u substitution techniques there and everything works out pretty well. Polynomial division or long division of polynomials. I'll show you the algorithm for it. I'll show you where we can kind of skip through it using some things like synthetic division. And then I'll try and also show you a way that we can maybe think about this uh, without having to apply a messy algorithm and still get some good results here. So anyways, you'll notice here that the degree on top is bigger than the degree of the polynomial on the bottom. Um, if they're the same or the numerator has a higher degree, that means we can like kind of reduce the fraction, so to say. Let me write it this way. 7 thirds. Uh, I know what 7 thirds is. It's a number. It's 7 thirds, right? But way back in elementary school, you might have looked at this and said, this is an improper fraction. We would like to rewrite this as some whole number and a smaller uh, proper fraction. And we'd say, okay, 3 goes into 7 two times. And then there's a 1 third left over. So we get this 2 and a third mixed number. Uh, I hate mixed numbers. There should be a little plus sign in here in my mind, but oh well. And then we end up doing the same kind of thing later on with like bigger and bigger and bigger division problems. Essentially, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to be able to rewrite this as x plus some sort of fractional part of x minus 1, a remainder. So what we'll do is we'll set up some long division. We're going to divide x squared plus 4x minus 1 by x minus 1. The long division algorithm is sometimes a little clunky for students, but we'll see if we can figure it out. Uh, we're going to try and look and see how many times does x minus 1 go into this first unit thing, x squared. What I'm really going to do is just focus on my leading term. How many times does x go into x squared? Well, I need to multiply x by x to get x squared. So I'll put an x right here in my x term, my linear side of things. Now I'll multiply, and I would get x squared minus x, if you do the distributive property. And then remember, in our division algorithm, we're always looking for a difference here. x squared minus x squared is 0. That's good. 4x minus negative x is 5x. And then we look at this last little part, this negative 1. We say, OK, how many times does x go into 5x? Or really, how many times could x minus 1 go into 5x minus 1? And we'll say, oh, 5. We have to multiply 
x by 5 to get 5x. So we'll do that. We'll make sure we do the distributive property, multiply everything. And remember, we're subtracting. So we have negative 1 minus negative 5, which is negative 1 plus 5. So this is a remainder of 4. And so what we can do is we can write this fraction as x plus 5 plus 4 over x minus 1, this fractional part. Now, you should hopefully see why this is really helpful for integration. Suddenly, this stuff is super easy, and this is about the smallest u substitution that we need to worry about. We can say u is equal to x minus 1, etc., etc., etc. Now, formally, I'm going to split this up. I'm going to say this is the integral of x plus 5 dx plus 4 times my integral of 1 over x minus 1 dx. Now I can do my u substitution here. And I end up with x squared over 2 plus 5x plus 4 natural log of x minus 1 plus c. That's not hard for us to see when we do this division. Now, the annoying part is doing this polynomial long division. There's an algorithm called synthetic division that works when you divide a polynomial by a linear thing. So since we're dividing by x minus 1, the biggest exponent is 1 on here. This is a linear polynomial. Synthetic division is something that can work. If you've seen it before, this is how it looks. Maybe I'll include a link on Canvas to see a little reminder of how synthetic division works. But if you've seen it before, this is what we do. We bring our 1 down, then we multiply. 1 times 1 is 1. Then we add. 4 plus 1 is 5. Then we multiply. 1 times 5 is 5. And then we add. Negative 1 plus 5 is 4. And here's our coefficient on our linear term, x plus 5, with a remainder of 4. Exact same thing that we ended up with. Now, the annoying thing is that the synthetic division algorithm kind of hides like the actual math that's going on, right? It's a nice, quick little trick. It doesn't really illuminate what's going on. Now, the long division algorithm, I don't think, shows that very well either because this is mostly a series of steps that students memorize to get to an answer without actually knowing what's going on. So what I'd like you to do, or what I would like to do, sorry, is just show you a different way of doing that. Uh, this is going to be really similar to completing the square. What we're going to do is we're going to divide x squared plus 2x minus 1 by x plus 4. And the way that we're going to do it is we're going to factor. I'm going to force x squared plus 2x minus 1 to factor into something times x plus 4. So what I'm going to do is make this be x plus 4 times something divided by x plus 4. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to take this thing and factor. And if we try it, we'll say, all right, we would need to factor this little numerator here. We're looking for numbers that multiply to get negative 1 and numbers that add to get positive 2. And there aren't any integer values that do that. So this thing can't be factored. And if it could, it certainly can't be factored into x plus 4 times something. So how do we do this? Well, what I'm going to say is that if we just had x squared plus 2x plus who cares what, and I knew that my factors had to be x plus 4 times something, then I know what they're going to be. Because again, I know I'm going to get a 4 times x, and I'm going to get whatever this constant term is times x. That's going to add up to my linear term. Like we said, we're looking for numbers that add up to get 2. So if one of the numbers is 4, and we want to add up to get 2, what's the other number? Clearly, it's negative 2. So I'm going to go ahead and just put x minus 2 in here. Now the problem is that x minus 2 times x minus 4 gives a polynomial that starts with x squared plus 2x, but it's certainly not x squared plus 2x minus 1. Let's see what it is. All this stuff, if you multiply it out, gives you x squared plus 2x minus 8. So you'll notice what we have to do is add 7 to our little numerator to get this minus 1. So now x plus 4 times x minus 2 plus 7 is x squared plus 2x minus 1. And now we can notice 
that this is really x plus 4 times x minus 2 over x plus 4 plus 7 over x plus 4. I'm going to split this fraction up. And when we do that, bang, these cancel, and we're left with an integral of x minus 2 plus 7 over x plus 4 dx. And this should be pretty easy to just integrate in our heads. x squared over 2 minus 2x plus 7 natural log of x plus 4. You'll notice that this looks a lot like what we did over here once we got our answer, right? Go ahead and apply the long division algorithm to this, and you'll end up seeing the same thing. And that's because what division is doing is saying, what do I need to multiply by this denominator here to get x squared plus 2x minus 1? I know just by looking at this that it's got to be in the form of x minus 2, and that's not going to be perfect. There's going to be some remainder. The remainder needs to be a plus 7. So the long division algorithm sometimes disguises what's going on. For small division of fractions like this, it might be easier to just kind of apply this little guess what you need to multiply by uh, trick. Once we end up with like fifth degree polynomials in the top and third degree polynomials in the bottom, sometimes it can get kind of tricky to figure that part out. And that's where a nice algorithm really helps. But in these small cases, it might be easy enough to just do this little, almost like a guess and check method here. Anyways, that's a list of a bunch of integration techniques that we might want to know going into this chapter, this unit on integration techniques. These are things that, again, not much of this should be new. Maybe it's different ways of approaching problems that you've seen before. Maybe you haven't applied every single thing that you've seen in this video to integration before. But most of this stuff you've probably seen. You've likely seen long division. You've likely seen conjugates. Maybe not in this context, but you've seen them. Anyways, hopefully that's helpful. We'll move on next time to a good integration formula for integration by parts, which is going to undo the product rule. Ooh, get excited. <laughs>